I'm Daniel Benjamin. I'm the president of the American Academy, and I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's Max Beckman lecture on character, what it is and why it matters uh, by Daniel Weiss. Um, I want to thank all of you for venturing out during these days when the sun uh, never peaks above the horizon. You all thought that the Arctic Circle was farther north. Little did you know. Um, and the rain and the snow, of course, never seem to stop. So I, um, I admire you all for being intrepid and coming out and for pursuing your intellectual nourishment. Uh, I should note that this is the Academy's final event of what has been a truly great semester, filled with terrific presentations by our fellows and our distinguished visitors. And this topic seems appropriately big and important um, to end the term with and uh, to, to contemplate at a particularly challenging moment. The topic is truly relevant. Um, the Washington Post today authoritatively reported that a former president of the United States, and I'm not going to say who, uh, delivered in the space of, five, of a five-minute interview 24 false or misleading statements. So I think and I'm happy to send you the link. Uh, I think we can agree that this is indeed an important and interesting question why character is no longer a topic for serious discourse in the public sphere. I am guessing that our speaker will tell us that honesty is an important part of character. Um, but before introducing our speaker, let me just say a quick word uh, about the back Max Beckmann Distinguished Visitorship. The visitorship which honors the memory of one of Germany's greatest painters of the 20th century, was established under the leadership of his granddaughter, Mayan Beckman, who is, I'm pleased to say is here tonight. Where is she? She was here a moment ago. There she is, over there. And um, uh, anyway, this is a wonderful lectureship that we have here. And many great artists uh, contributed works whose proceeds funded this program, which was established in 2017. And Mayan, an art historian and gallerist, has been hugely helpful with her advice and her engagement over the years that this visitorship has existed. And my thanks go out as well to several other supporters of the program uh, who I believe are here tonight. Now to uh, turn to our guest of honor, uh, Dan Weiss is our seventh Max Beckman Distinguished Visitor, and he follows in a line of exceptional artists such as Gary Kuhn, uh, Julie Maratu, and Arthur Jaffa. I'm particularly pleased that Dan has this visitorship because although we lionize our artists, and appropriately so, our culture depends vitally as well on those who manage cure and curate and lead the institutions that house the arts and educate the young. <clears throat> and in that regard, Dan Weiss has few peers. From 2015 until this past summer, he served as the president of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and he added the title of CEO of that greatest of all American museums in 2017. And I'm sorry if I offended anyone who likes another museum more, but I'm pretty sure which one uh, I'm giving that um, that title to. Uh, in times of financial stress, pandemic, and frequent controversy, Dan provided leadership that was steady, wise, and imaginative for an institution that, in a good year, has more than six million visitors, employs 2,000 people, and owns more than two million works of art, including many of the greatest ever created. I want to pause because those numbers give me a little vertigo. Uh, he, he combined uh, with that uh, a managerial skill. Uh, he combined with that managerial skill a powerful sense of the responsibility and the public trust that goes with running an institution such as that one. Uh, and I think that is something that we should all admire. Um, now, Daniel Weiss's time at the Met was a culmination of a career of leadership in major educational institutions. He had been president of both Haverford College and Lafayette College, both in Pennsylvania. And uh, earlier in his career, uh, he had been dean of the Krieger School 
of Arts and Sciences at Johns Hopkins University, uh, where he had also served as professor and chair of the History of Art Department. Reading this, I, I wonder if you, did you do all that before you were 20? Uh, <laughs> it's quite a remarkable set of accomplishments. Uh, today, uh, Dan is back at Hopkins as the Homewood Professor of the Humanities. Um, and it is appropriate that he's back in an institution where he not only taught and, if I may say, deemed, if that doesn't diminish uh, my character, that I just invented a word, but also where he received his doctorate in Western medieval and Byzantine art. And um, he does also have, I should mention, a master's in business administration from Yale, and he did his undergraduate work at George Washington University, where I believe he was a classmate. Uh, of his wife, Sandra, who is also here tonight. I'm delighted to say you were in the same class, weren't you? One year older. One year older, okay. Um, somehow, amid all those serious uh, management jobs, he found time to write or edit seven books and numerous articles. And along with works on art history, such as Art and Crusade in the Age of Saint Louis, his last two books give a hint of the scope of his thinking, namely, Why the Museum Matters, published in 2022. And before that, in that time, Michael O'Donnell and the Tragic Era of Vietnam. Well, Dan has, as you uh, might expect, innumerable honors, grants, honorary de degrees, membership in distinguished learned societies, and the rest. But um, I think the most important thing for you to know is that this is a return engagement for him. He spoke at the Academy in 2019, before I arrived, and I was inundated with so many positive remarks about his event uh, that I felt strongly that I needed to burnish my own record by having him back. And uh, I really am thrilled that he is joining us here at this time of year, for which he gets an extra medal. And uh, I hope you will welcome Dan Weiss to the podium. Well, thank you so much, Dan. It is a, a great pleasure to be here. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have a return visit. And before I turn to my subject proper, I'd like to just touch on two subjects. One is, when I came four years ago, I was running the Metropolitan, and I had been invited to come and give a talk about museums. So I put together some thoughts, things that I had been considering. But I hadn't given any serious thought to a more deep investigation of the questions that I was going to be speaking about. And my experience in this room was so lively and so engaging and interesting that I decided to write that book. It began here. And there is something, I saw the magic of this place and how extraordinarily interested people are, how serious they are about work and about ideas and collegiality. And so I took that inspiration and went off and, and had that experience. So I'm indulging myself by coming back to talk to you about another subject, which is, may very well turn into a book. But I apologize because I'm a museum and an art guy, and that isn't what I'm here to talk about tonight. So if you're willing to listen to me talk about character, when we have the questions and discussion, if you'd rather talk about museums, that's okay with me. Um, I'm happy to do that. But people have asked me, why are you writing on the subject of character, and what do you mean anyway? I'm going to answer the second question as I get into my remarks and do my, my presentation. But the reason I'm writing about this subject, and I want to speak to you about it today, is because in the course of the last 25 years, I've had the privilege of having positions of leadership in various institutions, cultural and educational institutions. And I have often been asked, especially in the last eight years leading the Met, what role and responsibility does the Met have in advancing the issues that we face in our society? What kind of role should we play as museum leaders to try to do the right thing or correct the wrongs in the world? And why aren't we speaking out on various issues and other issues? And in other words, we're, we're ethical institutions, and we have an obligation, in my view, to participate in the larger discussions that help to shape the direction of our society and our democracy. That doesn't mean, as head of the Met, that it was my responsibility to address issues around which I had no competence, but rather that we should think about our role in ethical terms and understand and appreciate the sensitivity and the fragility of the idea of character as a component of what makes a society function well and what makes lives worth living. So as I started, as I left the Met and I started becoming a professor again, and which means I had time to think about these things, 
I was reflecting on how I would like to advance my own understanding of that question because it seemed obvious to me, and it may or may not be obvious to you in looking around the world today, that this is not a subject people talk about. It is not a subject that people take seriously as a central question related to what it means to live in a free society, or again, to live a life of meaning and purpose. Yet every other society, I learned as I began my reading, every other society that represents itself as free always took this issue as a central consideration of who they were, how they lived, what they taught, and how they understood their own experience. Not this one, not now. So I began to think maybe there's a project here that's worth considering more deeply. The risk here is, and I'm going to promise I'm not going to go too long, but I found myself deeply in the subject of character happens to be vast. It goes all the way back to Socrates. And um, maybe our generation hasn't spoken about it much, but every other one has. So I want to try to take you through my thinking about the issue of character as an idea that has had a life that is interleaved with our own historical engagement with being alive. And every civilization has had something to say about it. So I want to talk about that more generally. But I am not deeply expert on these issues. Many of you will know much more about certain aspects of these questions than I do. That's why I'm here, so that we can talk about these issues and learn from each other. So that is my prolegomena to my remarks. So I'll begin by saying I, was, I have been interested in the subject of character for almost all of my adult life, both because of its essential importance as a determinant of leadership quality, and more generally for its role in shaping how we live among others and within ourselves. Regrettably, I myself was confronted by questions of character at the very outset of my career when, as a recent college graduate, I was appointed to the leadership role as manager of the gift shops at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Having served there as a stock clerk during my college years, a great job, by the way, I found myself promoted to the manager role the same week I graduated with the mandate that I find a way to solve an increasingly urgent and deteriorating problem of poor sales and sub substantial financial losses. Although I had learned a few things about the shops in my years on the staff, I certain, and I certainly had ideas about what we might try to do, I was generally inexperienced in the resale, retail sales business and had little real preparation to assume a leadership role in a complex institution with a large set of intersecting challenges. In replacing my recently fired boss, I was given six months to see if I could measurably improve the situation before senior management would bring in outside experts who knew more about turning around troubled businesses than I did. They actually even said to me, I was 22, we're going to let you try this for six months, and if you can't get it right, we'll bring in some grown-ups. Um, <laughs> to my advantage, and during this period, I was very fortunate that they gave me the latitude I needed to address the question, to bring in some resources. They weren't concerned about monitoring my day-to-day -day activity, they just wanted to see results. In the process of trying to restructure a business that had no meaningful internal controls, generally poor oversight of all components of the operation, no strategic vision, and effectively no mechanisms for evaluating overall performance, I discovered that the root cause of our problems was not simply declining sales or lack of interest by the public, although those were factors, but rather it was a widespread epidemic of stealing and dishonesty. Everywhere I looked, there was evidence of theft. In the course of implementing various new operating systems and financial controls, I found evidence throughout the organization of fraud, theft, and corrupt management practices, including those losses of merchandise, both at the shops and in the stockroom, forgeries of cash logs and financial rep reports enabling the theft of cash from the, shops, from the shops, embezzlement from the back office, and every other manner of crime one can consider. While contending with the challenge of reversing the fortunes of this modest retail sales operation, which was itself dedicated to supporting an uplifting public service mission, after all, this was the Kennedy Center, I learned a great deal about one rather negative aspect of character, a phenomenon that social scientists call situational dishonesty. It's a bit euphemistic. Although I was successful in restoring the business to health and I was able to continue my work at the Kennedy Center for several more years, I found it deeply dispiriting to have encountered at such an early age in my career evidence of widespread dishonesty among coworkers, several of whom I considered to be friends. Perhaps most surprising to me was the discovery that this was not the work of seasoned criminals, far from it. These were otherwise honest people 
including long-standing Kennedy Center volunteers who had retired from successful careers in government and business, professional accountants, and other members of the paid staff. I was troubled then and remain so now that given what appeared to be an easy opportunity to break the rules, or in this case the law, so many people did so readily, readily and repeatedly. Without clear rules, oversight, and some level of accountability, these people sought personal advantage, even though it was harmful to the mission they were there to serve, in the belief that they could do so without being caught. All of this, by the way, was eventually reported on in an NPR program some years later, This American Life, where I was interviewed about this experience, and then David Brooks went on to write a column about it in the New York Times, about which I knew nothing. I got up one morning to have breakfast, and I opened the newspaper, and it was a column about Dan Weiss as a kid at the Kennedy Center. So it was helpful to me because at the time this happened, I didn't say anything about what was going on, and I deeply regretted it subsequently that one way to address those issues should have been to be more transparent about them at the time. It turns out that my experience at the Kennedy Center was far from unique. The incidence of situational dishonesty is not especially unusual, and it is certainly related to the idea of character, my topic today. My current project explores the very large subject of character as an idea with a rich and vivid history, and in light of the many challenges before us, I think, a more problematic present. In my remarks today, I would like to touch on several major themes related to the subject of character, sometimes referred to in ancient Greece and Rome as virtue, but not exactly how we understand the term today. From the early teaching of Socrates and the various philosophical movements of the time to the Middle Ages and subsequent advances in moral philosophy and ethics during the period of the Enlightenment, and eventually to the present and the more problematic environment of fake news, post-truth, and the expansion of social polarization well beyond the political sphere. These are all my topics today, so settle down. We're going to be here a while. <laughs> my goal, though, is not to be comprehensive. I'm not writing a history of the philosophical, political, or cultural movements, but rather I want to try to examine just this question of character and how it was inflected from one moment to the next as a central consideration in the world at the time. Again, because I am struck by how much time and attention we devote to so many issues in the world today, but not this one. As we consider the frightful, frightful prospect of democracy's demise, both in the U.S. and elsewhere, as well as metastasized social polarization and the ongoing decline in our collective standard of living, I want to explore the reasons why human virtue, what we might call good character, has become profoundly undervalued as a centering force both for individuals and for our society, as it seems to me now to be the case. I'm sure that I'm not alone in observing that the qualities that we generally associate with good character, what moral philosophers call the key virtues, wisdom, courage, justice, and moderation, among others, such as kindness and compassion, are no longer held to be especially important in the hypercynical and profoundly distrustful world we live in today. And they are certainly not the subject for serious discourse in the public sphere. At a time of pervasive frustration and disillusionment with our communities, our institutions, and leaders, why is there so little place for discussion about the human qualities long recognized to be essential for personal well-being and social flourishing? I will argue that our current indifference to these questions is an essential and urgent challenge to sustaining a free society, ours and any other, and for many of us in building lives of meaning and purpose. This issue is as relevant to the functioning of the political sphere as it is to our personal lives and the well-beings of our communities. Cicero, who witnessed the dissolution of his beloved republic, insisted that those who rule and write the rules must also practice virtue. American founder and fourth president James Madison argued that no free society can endure if there is not a commitment to virtue among the people. For Cicero, as for Madison, the functioning of a free society depended on a shared commitment by the citizenry as well as its leaders to the qualities that we associate with good character. Such ideas may seem antiquated or misplaced in our instrumental and self-obsessed society, but they are surely at the center of what ails us today. As John Adams said, there has never been a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. Although Adams' pessimistic assessment may well be right, the urgent question before us is whether that such an outcome can be delayed, and if so, by what means. In my view, the question of character must be an essential consideration. 
But what exactly do we mean by the large and amorphous term character? Merriam-Webster offers 25 definitions or variants on the term. My focus is on the 13th of those variants, and that is the one related to moral behavior. For our purposes, I define character as a resolve of temperament to act with integrity, conviction, and a commitment to fairness, despite risk or negative consequences. H. Jackson Brown famously and quite simply defined character as a way of living when no one's looking. However one defines the term, the key elements must include subordinating self-interest to something larger, valu um, valuing principle and prioritizing others. The personal qualities of a good character include integrity, courage, honesty, and selflessness, as well as some combination of self-possession, empathy, a sense of fairness, and devotion to principle. Character, as we understand the word, is closely related to the ancient Roman term virtue, in which Cicero described as a habit of mind in harmony with reason and the order of nature, also rather simply defined. One might think of character as the essence or moral core of a free society, and for each person a central determinant of what it means to live a life of purpose and fulfillment. Although there are various ways of describing the idea, most of us recognize good character when we see it, and we can identify individuals who possess these qualities. We can all make our own lists, so I won't give you mine, but um, we all recognize what those qualities represent. People of good character contribute in various ways to the improvement or well-being of others, but there are personal benefits as well. These include the satisfaction that derives from aligning values with actions and the growth and resilience that accrues from successfully withstanding adversity. If we can generally agree on what we mean by good character, it is less clear how it is developed, and which, which was, all, by the way, a vital question for Socrates, and crucially, what is required to sustain it. I am inclined to agree with John Stuart Mill, who believed that we build on the character we are born with, arguing that, quote, we have real power over the formation of our own character, that our will, by influencing some of our circumstances, can modify our future habits, habits or capabilities of willing, unquote. Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was greatly interested in the subject of character, offered a similar view in saying, if we must accept fate, we are not less compelled to affirm liberty, the significance of the individual, the grandeur of duty, the power of character. Although he appreciated the importance of character, Alexander Hamilton was more skeptical. He didn't think, he, he was more skeptical that it could be cultivated as a means of improving the citizenry, observing that we must take man simply as we find him. Therefore, his concern was creating a system of laws that would allow a society to withstand the vicissitudes of bad character. In his recent book, The Road to Character, David Brooks takes Mill's idea a step further. Many of you may have read that book, where he proposes character is a set of dispositions, desires, and habits that are slowly engraved during the struggle against your own weakness. You become more disciplined, considerate, and loving through a thousand small acts of self-control, sharing, service, and friendship. At least since the time of Socrates, the subject of character has been a consequential issue for thoughtful people dedicated to leading lives of freedom and personal fulfillment. Um, Emerson was among the first Americans to explicitly explore this subject. He wrote a book on it where he profiled various people that he admired. And there have been various books since written on that, but I'm struck by the relative few number. There are many books on related topics about kindness and uh, generosity and evil, and there are many self-help books about how to live better, but the life of the idea of character and what it represents throughout history, there is not so much. As we reflect on our present circumstances, is having a good character still necessary for our well-being, or in the realm of business, government, or social networks? At least to me, it seems clear that we no longer place such emphasis on that importance, and um, it has drifted from the agenda aside perhaps from the pleasure that some derive in identifying culpable behavior in others. I see little evidence that character matters much in our daily lives and certainly not in our choice of leaders, an observation that, if indeed it's correct, imperils us. More for the most part, we, are not, we no longer teach ethics or social responsibility at any level in our schools, although I'll come back to that. A serious and sustained interest in character has been inextricably associated with free societies and personal well-being throughout all of human history. 
These ideas were at the center of philosophical and political discourse in societies that placed a high value on democratic or republican ideals since antiquity, which were revived and advanced during the period of the Enlightenment and into the early years of the American experiment. The American founders were deeply engaged with questions of virtue and character as they created a government and institutions that were intended to sustain liberty and democracy across generations. In recent years, as we have experienced the unprecedented loss of trust in our institutions and in each other, we have witnessed new levels of cynicism bordering on nihilism in our collective disregard for the foundational principles and values that have inspired the best in us and sustained all free societies thus far. To be sure, there are myriad reasons for the erosion of our levels of trust, many of them well-deserved, our values and our expectations of each other. These include the polarization of our politics and more generally our society, unprecedented levels of economic inequality, and the replacement of real citizenship with vir virtual proxies, among many others. I'd like to offer a brief overview of, of um, the role that character has played in history. We'll move quickly. Outline some of the root causes of its declining importance today and offer a few proposals for how we move forward. If character is an indeed an, it's an essential element of a functioning democracy and if it helps us to achieve lives of meaning and fulfillment, then we need to elevate the visibility of this problem and find a better way forward. So let's reflect on the long history very briefly and I'll just touch on a few themes. If we think about the role of character in the ancient world, it was first Socrates who brought there was a lot of interest in character in ancient narrative. The earliest recorded narrative of anything we have is the Epic of Gilgamesh, which was written about 1800 BC and in various versions survives. This was not a study in moral character, but it was an examination of the nature of character and the oppositional relationship between the protagonists in the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh himself and his friend Enkidu. And thereafter, of course, the Iliad and the Odyssey are not moral examinations of character, but they are about the life of individuals, the choices we make, the consequences we live with, all of which were fundamental to the subsequent consideration of character as developed in the first instance by Socrates, who was interested in understanding the good life and what it means to live a life of virtue, articulating the cardinal virtues that we came to embrace quite broadly, of prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance, those ideas were taken up by the Stoics, the Romans, Aristotle, Cicero, everybody embraced those as a way to codify and discuss the concept of character. Socrates was also interested in the key question of whether virtue could be taught. And there's a great history and a very interesting story about his relationship with Alcibiades, who was his student and maybe his lover, one of the most remarkably talented people of the ancient world, beautiful, brilliant, charismatic, and utterly, completely unprincipled. And Socrates was unable to engage in a serious process of change, although they loved each other. If you Google Alcibiades, you will see all the bad things that he did, notwithstanding his advantages and the categorical failure of Socrates as his teacher. Rome was more interested in the civic aspect of virtue, not so much individual virtue for its own sake, but the place of virtue in advancing the values of a republic or in, a free, or in any kind of free society. They celebrated that idea broadly. They had a concept called mos maiorum, which was the way of the ancestors. There's a way you do things. Laws alone cannot sustain fair treatment. There has to be also a commitment on the part of the leadership to do the right thing. And when Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon, he violated that tradition, eventually leading to the dissolution of the Republic that Cicero loved so much and a transformation of the Roman world into an empire. We might, this is not a political talk, but we might reflect on when Donald Trump would not accept the results of the 2010 election, notwithstanding all of the evidence to the contrary, and every lawsuit that he, that was rejected, was, he failed, he nonetheless will not accept that. And that is a fact, that is an aspect of the most maiorum as we think about it in the world today. In the Middle Ages, character took on a very different slant. It was a time of religion and faith. And I only want to touch on it briefly because the period that we're talking about, the Roman Empire continued in the Byzantine world. The concept of Byzantine Empire is one that was retrospectively given to those people. They were Romans. They were inheritors of the same traditions and the same history of Rome. But something very significant happened which transformed that society, in particular its relationship to the question of character. 
When Constantine the Great in the fourth century took on Christianity as an official religion, relocated the capital of the Roman Empire to Constantinople, present-day Istanbul, and in the course of about two centuries thereafter, the Latin culture became a Greek culture, the Roman Empire was transformed and the concept of virtue along with it. No longer was virtue what Plato or Socrates would have described it to be, but rather virtue and faith came to be closely intermeshed. And it was the word, the book, the Bible the, that provided the law and in some ways a handbook for how to live. So that changed the ways in which we thought about the questions of virtue. Um, Christopher Hitchens had much to say about that. He was a very colorful critic of religion, and he wasn't speaking directly of the Middle Ages, but he had this to say. He said that religion imposes effectively a celestial dictatorship where the leader is greedy for uncritical praise, demanding of our full devotion and swift to punish. But like all dictatorships, it offers a solution to the vexing problem of determining right from wrong. During the period of the Middle Ages, these issues were clarified. There is a way to live, and that, that instruction will be given to you. But as a result of that, society went from civic to ecclesiastic, the obligations of the citizen, uh, from the citizen to those of the catechumen, and philosophy was effectively replaced by theology. The new concept of virtue was a very different one. It was more about faith, loyalty, prudence, compliance, kindness, but not curiosity, skepticism, imagination, or independence. And as a result, we see a very different concept, and that lasted for over a millennium. So by the time of the Enlightenment, we see the rebirth of a commitment to this idea that both drew from classical antiquity and Renaissance humanism, but was explicitly dedicated to a very different idea about how we think about what character represents. And the idea of character for them had become an essential component in the study of ethics, moral philosophy, political theory, and cultural history, all of those things. The work was coincident with the establishment of institutions holding these values, universities, museums, learned societies, as well as scientific and medical institutions, and especially democratic governments. All of them were thought to be ethical institutions. All of them were thought to have to carry that obligation to be credi credible and successful. In all of this work, there was much new thinking on the question of character, which was seen to be essential to the good life, but acknowledged, and this is crucial, to be fragile. Difficult to sustain over time unless it's given deep care and attention. And for the idea of liberalism to succeed, it was expected that there would absolutely be virtue in the people. As Alan Ryan who, uh, observed with reference to the work of John Stuart Mill, he says, quote, Mill intended for liberalism for civilized people, not barbarians. In other words, if you don't have a willing and supportive community committed to those objectives, you cannot impose it on them. They must embrace it. Enlightenment thinkers further recognized that the creation of democratic governments required at some level virtue in the people and the leaders, and that this was not likely to be sustainable, which is why John Adams said what he did. Those ideas were transplanted to America at the founding of uh, the United States. The founders drew their inspiration in the first instance, not from the Enlightenment, but from the classical world, and especially Rome. They were very much committed to the idea that virtue must be an essential element in the, citizen, the, citizen, the citizenry and the leaders, drawing on the thinking of Montesquieu as much as on Cicero. They were wide range in their, in their learning and in their thinking, and they believed that the core principle of a republic must be the virtue of the civic kind, meaning that the people would put the public interest before their own, they would be free from personal ambition and inspired by patriotism. This was actually the idea behind the concept of the pursuit of happiness, which was never about personal pleasure, but about advancing the, the interests and the concerns of the larger community and recognizing that self-government requires personal self-government. This was an issue that was widely debated. It wasn't an absolute given in the founding years. Uh, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, for example, engaged in many debates about this. How much should laws determine what pe how people live? What should the Constitution look like in order to make sure that people behave a certain way? Many of the founding fathers believed that virtue was something they could count on. Hamilton, not so much. And in the end, they tried to find the right balance between laws and deeds. For the founders, Rome was the exemplar. 
that was where they looked. And indeed, most of us recognize that George Washington was seen as the new Cato, the Roman leader, Cato the Younger, who sacrificed everything for his values up when he was up against Caesar. Washington was stoic, self-sacrificing, courageous, aloof, and profoundly civic-minded. He was seen as the new Cato. That was the model. Throughout the founding years of, a, and I'm not going to go through all of American history, I promise. Um, the idea, though, is that these concepts were front and center throughout the history of this country, of the United States as well. And we find ourselves at an unusual moment where, as I say, for the first time there isn't great robust discussion about the obligations of the citizenry. And I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes here. But let's begin by reflecting on, so why is there a problem now? They, what, what can we do about that? And I'll, I'm going to conclude my remarks by saying a little bit about what I think is the causes of this issue, and then a few suggestions about what we might do about it. So I think there are many different contributing factors to the current situation we're in. And I'm going to mention six. They're all vast. They're all topics that alone deserve enormous amounts of tension and concern. But we have to start somewhere, so I'd like to call out what I see. The first is the rapid pace of change in our society has imposed an endless sequence events of events over ideas, which overwhelms deep thinking or serious reflection. Before we know it, the next issue after the next issue. Um, that's sort of the world we live in. Sometimes people think, and there's no accountability. Sometimes people think canceling is a form of accountability, but it really masquerades as that. It's, not, it's actually, I think, something else. Given the rush of events, our focus on most issues is fleeting and often capricious. In the midst of so much noise, character-driven behavior, which tends to be slower and more reflective, takes too long and is usually not at all rewarded. The second issue is political polarization, more obvious. Hyperpartisanship places the entire focus on winning and tribalism over the greater good of the community or nation. This was already a problem by the election of 1800 when John Adams and Thomas Jefferson went at it and they, neither one of them were carrying character as a virtue, I can assure you. Um, so it's a long-standing issue. That said, it's arguable that the polarization in our society today is reaching a new low. Making matters worse, the problem has gone beyond politics because political identities have become layered on top of social identities, creating entrenched orthodoxies for groups and the individuals within them. The problem is worsened by the ways various groups curate access to their own information, effectively cultivating their own truth, to affirm and deepen existing views. Complicating things even further, social media and other platforms tend to amplify extreme views on both sides, which the market rewards, obscuring the voices of the people in the middle who tend to be more capable of listening and compromise. All of this has eroded trust in institutions and diminished the societal value placed on character. For example, interestingly, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences last year did a major study on the issue of trust, and they did a, a longitudinal survey of the level of trust and confidence people play in institutions, pay in institutions across categories. They looked at 20 categories of institution, higher education, Wall Street, law firms, the military, and so forth. In the last 50 years, of the 20 categories they surveyed, 19 of them diminished substantially. Only one increased during that period, and that is the military. And there are various reasons for that, not the least of which was the survey began in 1972 in the middle of the Vietnam War, so people didn't have much regard for the military then. The third factor is the eroding concept of citizenry. At the center of the citizen problem, the citizenship problem is an undue emphasis on rights over responsibilities. Richard Haas, in his new book, The Bill of Obligations, argues that the U.S. is facing a decay of democracy from within precisely for this reason. The evidence for this is failed leadership, identity politics, and a loss of commitment to service or the public good. To this point, philosopher Michael Sandel has argued, quote, to be free is more than a matter of pursuing my interests unimpeded or satisfying my desires, whatever they happen to be. It is to share in self-government, to deliberate about the common good, to have a meaningful voice in shaping the forces that govern our lives." Unquote. The problem is exacerbated by factionalism fueled by social media at a massive scale. Most of that is anonymous, which overwhelms the sense of community as well. The fourth, 
Economic inequality, this is probably the most formidable problem of our time. Neither democracy nor citizenship can work in a society, they just can't, that is profoundly unequal. It is not sustainable. Montesquieu observed that wealth inequality is fatal to a republic because it breeds distrust and places too much focus on self-interest. This is ultimately destabilizing for all of us, the rich and the poor, and it is corro corrosive of the idea of virtue because I would argue at some level we all know it's wrong and unfair to live this way. Five, the loss of common identity, polarization, diversity, and growing distrust all feed the forces of factionalism and division. For a nation of immigrants, as the United States has always been, that's a challenge, but never more so perhaps than it is today. A cluster of micro-communities is not the same as a nation. There is no center. The cultivation of individual virtue beyond parochialism is especially difficult in such a context. Six in my list of six, this is my last of why it's a problem. Pro pro profound failures of leadership. For better or worse, the example of leaders helps to set, the example of leaders helps to set an ethical frame for a society. In recent years, there has been ample evidence of widespread and highly visible moral failures in leadership across the spectrum. With all of these, so that's, th that's my list of six. You may have your own contributing factors as to what's happening here. And as you can see, if we could fix all of those, character wouldn't be an issue we need to talk about because we'd live in nirvana. That said, those kinds of issues, I think the argument I'm trying to make is that all of those things, there's a kind of negative synergy between those issues and the question of character. And one has to then figure out how does one jumpstart one or the other. The issue of character within those issues uh, what is the cause and what is the effect? But that said, the center is not holding. So finally then, what might we do about it? And I will conclude with a couple of observations and we can certainly talk about them more. If we are seeking a virtuous cycle, if we can somehow begin to believe, to develop processes that help people to feel better about their contribution to well-being, then we are on our way. I believe that's essential for us. So I have five suggestions. One, find ways to increase our accountability to each other. We must address the problem of scale and anonymity in our culture, because without meaningful relationships of some kind, there can be no commitment to shared values or virtue. And I am not a Luddite. I'm on use the internet and community, social media as much as anyone else. But that kind of scale and anonymity, un it undermines the ability to build accountable relationships with each other. We are fundamentally social animals. Two, cultivate character through instruction. The elements of character, such as civics and ethics, they can be taught. One recent example that is very encouraging, at my institution, Johns Hopkins, the Agora Institute has recently put in place that the whole institute is dedicated to civic engagement, and there is now an academic minor in civic, civic life made accessible to students across their fields of discipline, whatever else they're studying. I think there is traction in higher education to make a difference, or more to the point, the work of independent foundations and think tanks like New America can make a huge difference in the way our society moves forward. I think the answer is going to come from those places more than it is from governmental leaders. Three, we need to find a way to rebuild trust. The erosion of trust is widespread and corrosive to the constructive engagement of citizens with the government, institutions, and each other. In my 25 years of working as a leader and mostly in higher ed, I have seen how palpable that is. Once people thought I actually had a good job. They don't think that anymore. And um, that's because they have much disdain for what it is that we do and distrust for the way we operate. Much work is now being done on the question of trust, including this study by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which, as I mentioned, is working on an initiative around restoring trust. Four, political reform. We must move our politics from the margins to the middle, finding new mechanisms for greater pluralism and compromise. First steps are, it seems to me, in the, U in the U.S. anyway, campaign finance and gerrymandering. Maybe we start there. The government work, must work for more people and be more representative or it cannot function. History teaches us that. I very often point out to people when I was at the Met, we were walking around the museum and seeing all the different displays and exhibitions and cultures. Almost to, without exception, every one of the civilizations that are represented in that museum are failed civilizations. They're over. They're done. 
So for anyone to presume that this experiment that we live in today is so resilient as to continue, just go visit a great museum and look at all the cultures that had the same thing to say and lasted far longer than the American experiment in democracy did. I think that issue of fragility needs to be more front and center if we're going to make those investments. And it relates also, political reform requires addressing the issue of economic inequality. And then finally, I think we need a new social contract. We need a better framework for a functioning liberal society where there is evidence of greater fairness and clarity about roles. And I think Richard Haas has it exactly right in his book, The Obligations of Citizenship. It's a very short book. It's a good read. It's very aspirational, but he makes the argument, let's start this new, I'll call it a social contract, he doesn't, with these 10 goals. Be informed, get involved, stay open to compromise, remain civil, reject violence, value norms, promote the common good, respect government service, support the teaching of civics, put country first. So how do we do all of that? very heavy lecture I have given. I apologize for that. You thought an art historian is going to talk about maybe Manet or, I don't know, the Renaissance. As Jim Mattis said, where to begin, the impact of participation trickles up. Rosa Parks did not start out by taking on all of Jim Crow. She started out by taking a seat on a bus. We can begin by reminding ourselves that our democracy depends on us meeting our larger obligations to others and in so doing, we can find greater purpose and fulfillment in our own lives. But we must agree that this work is worth doing. As Mattis observes, we might begin with our own small steps and let them trickle up. And if we cannot agree on anything else, we might acknowledge that the alternative, which is looming just before us on the horizon, is simply unacceptable. But neither is it inevitable. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Dan, thanks very much. There's an enormous amount to talk about. I, I know I said this was the last event of our, of our semester. I think it may be the first all-night one, too. <laughs> um, it's an enormous subject, and it's one I'm, uh, I'm thrilled that you addressed. Uh, and I think it takes a lot of bravery to uh, address it, actually, precisely because it's so difficult to get your arms around, and there's so many controversial things uh, within it, but I, I think that this is, um, you know, a, a civilizational conversation that we um, need to have, and um, I'm sure everyone in the audience is going to have uh, great questions. I, I will just say, for me, this um, started out a long time ago when I uh, unwisely took a, a whole semester to study Aristotle's ethics, which is all about my right. character, and then I suddenly found that people had been writing about it all the way up to contemporary philosophers. I'm also thrilled, um, and you made reference to this, that civics is, is coming back. I'm not sure it's roaring back, but it is coming back and is showing up in a lot of school systems. It's become a high priority in the United States. So let me um, begin with the first question, because uh, I don't think this really came up in your talk, and that is... Um, do you think that, uh, you know, making character uh, front and center is, pop is possible uh, in a thoroughly capitalist society which puts such a high value on money in instead of right. uh, virtue? You know, it's Marx, all that is solid melts into the air. Uh, it's Donald Trump saying those soldiers, why did they do that? They were suckers. Right. Um, so why don't you start there? That may yeah. be, that's a pretty tough one to start Well, let me, let me say two things. One is, it is, this topic is vast, and I was very mindful of the fact that it, is a, takes, it does take a certain kind of ambition to touch a subject like this, because I could write a whole book about Aristotle's ethics, or someone else could write one better than I could, but the right people won't read that book. We don't need to talk to the people who already understand this issue. We need somehow to try to raise both the visibility of the problem and its connectedness to so many aspects of life that they're not particularly mindful of. So my goal is, in writing this book, to try to write a book that's actually vastly, many, many subjects, it's relatively short, 
that is readable by the, a general audience just to get them thinking about the historical nature of this question and a little bit more humility about the presumptiveness that we have today that these are not our concerns. Go to the Met, take a look at all those civilizations that said the same thing. So my goal is to try to take this material and in a way make it accessible to people who aren't effectively you guys, but more broadly. I do think late stage capitalism and economic inequality has undermined in a fundamental way the way we think about this question. If you walk across great college campuses in the US and you ask young people what they want to study or what they want to do in their lives, you're going to get answers like private equity 10 times more than you're going to get answers about doing higher education or working it for the government or other things because we as a society value money. Many political theorists have argued, and I think rightly, that when you live in an oligarchy, you inevitably flatten the role of representative government, particularly at the legislative, letter, the, the legislative level. And I think we're seeing that. I would argue the US is living in an oligarchy today, if you look at the distribution of wealth and the power. So maybe that's inevitable, and maybe it's hopeless, but um, we Let's need to talk it. about it. And, and what's the alternative? So I think uh, some of the forces, I was also mindful as I'm making my list of things to do, they're almost banal in the kind of things, yeah, well, let's get rid of economic equality. We can probably cover that by 8.30. Then let's turn to political reform by a quarter to nine. That said, we are not making a lot of progress in our society. And it needs to be more popularly understood and appreciated, the centrality of those issues to their own well-being and to the possibility of a viable future. So I think the number one issue probably is economic inequality. I think that's what the American Academy of Arts and Sciences concluded as it relates to the issue of distrust, that um, you got to start there. And I don't think any thoughtful political theorist would tell you you can have a sustainable situation like the one we're having in the U.S. with that kind of economic inequality. So... I just want to add a footnote and say to any potential donors out there, I'm not anti-capitalist. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, next question, and then I'll stop because I'm, at least for a minute, because I'm sure there are plenty of good questions out there. How do you um, propose to have a wide-ranging um, discussion about character and not have it hijacked by uh, conservatives who use it as a code word uh, for rejecting uh, everything from divorce to uh, gay lifestyles to interracial marriages to all kinds of different behaviors that I think, you know, our society, I think most of us would agree uh, are positive, empowering, and liberating developments, you know, one of the great apostles of character over the last 30, 40 years was um, the former Secretary of Education, Bill Bennett, who, as far as I could see, um, and by the way, is a compulsive gambler, and he's admitted to that, um, but as far as I could see, you know, was just using this as a huge cudgel uh, to beat back every kind of life-affirming behavior that he didn't like. So, you know, I think that's a big challenge. Well, that kind of, of self-righteousness is almost always a mask of hypocrisy. I get that. I think, I'll say two things. One is, I think, um, what I would really like to do, I, I'm trying to, to do this book in a way that is not evangelical or hectoring. I don't want to tell people how to live or what's right. But just to raise the visibility and the mindfulness of our own control over how we think about the role we play in the world. By the way, voting matters. And by the way, there are things we can do to protect our citizenry. So I think all one can do, I can do, is try to tell the story the way I would like to tell it. And if people help me write a better book and, they, and then it's not doesn't come across that way, then maybe it will make a difference. The other thing and more important thing to say is, and this is perhaps especially timely given the, the world events, or at least the United States events of the last week, I am a deep and passionate believer in the power and discomfort of free speech. So I, it, let them say whatever they want to say about character. Let's have that discussion and let Bill Bennett's surrogate stand up and talk about how you want to talk about character? This is how we live. And we'll have another moral North Korea like Christopher Hitchens describes it. That's how you live properly. And let other voices that are thoughtful stand up and make their argument. 
The best learning, the greatest way we can make any progress on any meaningful issue is deep discussion that is candid and honest and that bumps into our own discomfort. It is only at the nexus of, of our own discomfort that we can learn anything. So let them, we will be better off hearing those kind of character uh, defenders, as it were, or inflectors, say what they want to say because it is in the counter argument we'll get better at this. And that's, I think, ultimately, if we can protect venues like this one, or universities, ideally, not so great right now, where freedom of expression matters, and we can really debate issues, then this problem is going to be um, addressed one way or the other. Questions? Let's start right here. Just wait for the microphone. Make sure you have a question mark at the end of the question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I was reminded of uh, the words of a German constitutional court president that uh, democracy depends on values that it cannot generate itself. And uh, virtue, character may count among uh, these virtues. And that's, this leads, in my opinion, uh, to a trilemma between character as an immutable precondition, democracy as a process that is uh, advocating change and uh, popularity, and uh, the individuality of the citizens uh, in a time of secularity, and uh, what else did I say? Freedom, individuality. And the question is, how do you get out of this conundrum, out of this trilemma? Uh, who is actually uh, leading to the change that you ask for? The change in the sense of rebuilding trust, rebuilding, reforming institutions. Thank you. It's a wonderful question. It is, of course, at the center of figuring that out, is at the center of whatever progress we might make. I think what every civilization and society has contended with is there's a certain mystery to that question. Sometimes it's a charismatic leader who can bring about change in ways that galvanizes the population. More often than not, it's a social movement that's more groundswell than that. Sometimes it comes out of a catastrophic historical experience like a war where people reach a certain low and they confront that. I think the, the only way forward for us is to what we in theory do best, not this week, is debate issues. And that we live in a free society, we need to f surface the concerns and find venues for discussing them so that we can elevate our own knowledge about those issues in so doing. And so I, again, I, I think of Anne-Marie's new, uh, new America think tank. You know more about it than I do, but that's your business. That's exactly what you're trying to do. And to find ways to get a purchase on one aspect of the issue or somewhere else where there's a little bit of traction, to put some resources into a particular initiative. And I think if we can get enough public interest in the idea that it matters and make incremental progress across the board. Imagine, for instance, if we could make some progress in the American government, in the American system, on either campaign finance or gerrymandering. Those would actually create a representative government. We don't have one now. And admittedly, those are huge things. If we can get those sorted out by 9 o'clock, we're great. Um, but I think there is the only possibility is that there isn't one solution. There are 10 million of them. But one needs to start by creating enough energy around a social movement with particular ideas they can act on. It's one thing to say everything's a mess. It's hopeless. But um, I have a TV show I'm going to watch at 9 o'clock. You know, I did my part. It's quite another thing to begin to put, to tie these concerns to specific actions that produce enough reinforcement to justify further action. So small steps, just as Jim Mattis said, get on the bus, let's start there and see what can happen. Absent that, we're lost. I think it's that simple. Holly. Thanks so much. Um, I'm Holly Case. I'm a fellow here this semester. I have a couple of questions. One is about whether you think uh, character is historical. Uh, you often have virtue standing in for character, and virtue uh, is often associated with manly characteristics. It comes from the root vir, 
and uh, some of the characteristics described, self-discipline, et cetera, are uh, historically associated with manly qualities and other ones like care, for example, or uh, sensitivity, you know. Um, and the question is whether something like character would be considered historical in your view and whether, if it's historical, what is the character constellation for our moment that would be most meaningful? And uh, second is about scale, because you mentioned that, you know, when things are at a, a very high scale, uh, you have to go back down to this level uh, of, you know, interactions at the, you know, in, at the human scale or at the smaller scale. And my question is about whether character changes at scale. So, for example, uh, when, uh, uh, let's say, historically, one, a lot of the oldest laws are about a very small scale interactions like the Ten Commandments are about don't kill your you know don't envy your neighbor you know like right. uh, respect your family you know there's they're they're very small scale endeavors but we're living in a time when our ethics are called upon to be large-scale ethics global ethics we're expected to have a global consciousness to be aware of the impact of our actions uh, globally and I wonder if uh, character at the local level is qualitatively uh, different from character when uh, it functions at this more global level. Yeah, thank you for your questions. With regard to the first question, I completely agree. I use the concept virtue in a historical sense in my talk, not so much as, a, as an ongoing idea, recognizing that, and I said that, that as well, that the concept of virtue as it was defined in antiquity is not how we think about character today, but it was the term that they used. Uh, I don't believe that the concept of character should be in any way rigid or cast in stone, but actually I think it's a more open-ended concept that has more to do with the world we live in. There, there needs to be, I think, a historical appreciation of the centrality of what we think of as character in our work, but how we actually define it might change in some ways from generation to generation. I did offer my own version of Merriam-Webster. I said that it, it is a resolve of temperament to act with integrity, conviction, and a commitment to fairness despite risk or negative consequences. I left it rather open-ended. Um, I am reluctant to make the analogy to pornography, as Potter Stewart did. He said, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. And I don't think character is dramatically different from that. We know the central elements of what we're talking about. They will vary in particular inflection, I think, across time. But I, I'm not so worried about that, that we're going to forget what it means, as long as we have societies constructed in the basic ways they are today. Your second question about global versus local, I had not thought about that. But it seems to me, as I reflect on the term, I don't see a difference, but it's worth thinking about. And I will reflect on that question. But I don't, and I think those central impulses, I think accountability, what I was getting at is our obligations to each other elevate our sense of purpose and obligation because most of us want to be accountable to the people we care about. And if you don't have that kind of accountability and you can get away with stealing money from the cash register at the Kennedy Center and guaranteed no one's ever going to know, you might do that. But if, in fact, we are more connected to each other in ways that social media prohibits, then maybe there would be a higher level of accountability. It's a scale issue, but not only a scale issue, it's something else. I'm looking over here. I'm trying to go back and forth. So, right, yes, you with the hand up, right. <laughs> with the hand up? Yeah, okay. <laughs> exactly. No, no, you're, you, okay. you, you've got the mic. Um, hi, thank you for this talk. Pleasure to be here at the last uh, talk of the season. Um, speak up, okay. Oh, stand up. <laughs> Okay, uh, if you say so. Um, anyway, I'm an art historian, and I wanted to ask an art question, uh, but I'll try to tie it into character, I think. So I wanted to ask about um, acquiring artworks or the collection or, or when artworks get collected. Usually this requires um, especially significant works for a significant sum of financial means or resources, and I know you were in your tenure when the name Sackler was removed uh, from seven galleries of the Met, including obviously one of the most significant. And I wanted to ask you what uh, is possible with art patronage, given maybe questions around character um, of the people who collect, because I know when it's state funding, that's also 
has its own challenges because then you have to depend on the character of people reviewing things like applications and juries. So, just it, It's actually a wonderful question for this talk because it relates to both the art thing and the character thing. The, 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 at the center of that question, I think, is the concern that um, how does an institution make a determination around the suitability of someone who might want to support the mission? And I have thought about this issue a great deal. So what if, for example, as a thought experiment using, let's say, an American analogy, someone came to us and said, we'd like to give you $25 million for the Metropolitan for an, a gallery or for whatever needs to be done. And in exchange for that, the only little thing is we'd like to have our name on the gallery, and we're the Proud Boys. We're, we're a group that's, that's invested in the destruction of democracy, and, but, but we're going to give you the money. That's an easy one. We'd say, no, we're not going to do that, because in my view, the line is one, an institution should not accept money from anyone who will undermine its core mission. But that's it. And what I have said repeatedly in, in discussing this issue from place to place is there's no one right answer for any institution. But every institution with an ethical obligation needs to find the answer for itself. And that might vary a bit over time. My own inclination is that if you're a mission-driven institution, whether you're the American Academy in Berlin or the Metropolitan Museum of Art, your primary obligation is to generate support for the mission. So continuing that thought question, if let's say the Proud Boys came to us and said, we'll give you $25 million for your gallery, and there's a 100% chance no one will ever know we gave you the money. It's to be anonymous, and there's a guarantee ironclad that no one's going to know it. So in taking their money, we are not laundering their reputation. Let's assume the money was given to us legitimately. It's not stolen. Um, should we take it? What is the advantage to them, and what is the advantage to us? That kind of question needs to be deliberated by ins each institution. But as soon as you go too far in the other direction and decide, I don't like that guy. He's a loudmouth. I don't want him around. The next thing he's going to want to be on the board. Let's not take his money. You're doing something else rather than advancing the mission, and that is engaging in a kind of club-like selective behavior, and that's against the mission. So finding that balance is a critical question, and I said earlier in this presentation that universities, museums, we think of ourselves as ethical institutions because we have an obligation in the public interest to behave in ways that's consistent with our values and our laws, not just our instrumental objectives. And I think Sacklers are in one case in study, but there are lots of ways you'd have to come after the right answer from institution to institution. And there are plenty of times when taking the money is a bad idea, but it should be rare. No, no, Nadine, in front of you, right in front of you. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Well, thank you very much and uh, for this uh, great talk. Um, I'm a Rudy Bresser, and uh, I, <clears throat> I think I'm an economist, sort of. Uh, anyway, I have a, I have a question pertaining uh, to the role of incentives in society. Uh, can you imagine or think of a system where uh, incentives that are being set provokes uh, self-interested behavior that ultimately leads to the virtuous behavior we're all looking for, such as moderation or justice or whatever. I mean, we yeah. have this uh, um, currently at the center of a political debate in Germany uh, where the Greens and the current government wants to encourage people uh, to behave ecolo ecologically more responsible. So uh, they don't find the right incentives, at, at least <laughs> up to this point is my belief. But I wonder what you think about that. Yeah, it's a wonderful question. We are all, however aspirational we are in our discussions about character, we're all fundamentally self-interested creatures. So ideally, the answer to that is social approbation. That if you live in a society that holds character as a virtue, like in the day of George Washington, um, and again, I, I do not wish this project to be all about the good old days. That is not my intention. But if, if character and the virtues that, um, now I'm mindful of the word virtue, if character is expressed in those ways, and it is, it is sometimes there's a very heavy price to pay, but that if it's appreciated and valued and the, the instrumental and material returns are forthcoming as a result, you might, for instance, be hired into a leadership position because you exemplify character in ways that maybe some of your competitors don't. That's something that, that search committees and, and uh, populations think about when they're electing leaders. 
Uh, that is not a subject that gets discussed in the United States much at all about whether or not this, I, I'm going to elect this congressperson because their positions on these things are this and they're in this party, and I think we can get that done. Whatever their track record is, is often less important. So I think one sort of incentive is the most obvious and, and nebulous of them, and that is uh, the social support that comes out of living in a society that values it. There are other instrumental ways to do it. There are various foundations that give recognition to people who behave in various ways. That is, uh, there are lots of organizations that do that. Um, and so I think that's, that's not a great answer to your question. I cannot think of a more sophisticated or enlightened way to seed the idea of incentive into an economy to get people to do the right thing. But um, my job is to put the idea out there. Your job is to figure out the economic incentives. And then we'll meet. <laughs> okay. Anne-Marie, did I see your hand up? You've been, you're, you've been called into this a couple of times already, so <laughs> I think you need to uh, step up. So, Dan, thank you so much. I'm Anne-Marie Slaughter. I'm a fellow fellow uh, here at the Academy. And I'm very sad to think this is the last talk of our, our fellowship, but it was a wonderful one. Um, I don't have all the answers. I will say that I think on political reform, your point on, or Jim Mattis's point about participation trickling up is the right one. I mean, if you can't get federal uh, political reform, you can get reform at the level of the states. You can even uh, more locally yeah. than that. And that kind of participation and sense of agency it w is catching. Uh, and I, I, I do think we're seeing real progress at the state level. My question was about the tension between the two halves of character when you described the shift from Rome to the Middle Ages and then you, you know, philosophy becoming theology and you had all the kind of prudential, courageous, uh, strong sides of, of character, but you didn't have skepticism and curiosity and and... When I think about what what is kind of maybe gone wrong or at least contributed to cynicism in our society, I think about South Park, I th which my kids grew up on, which was hilariously funny, but definitely challenged the notion of any stuffy old notion about you shouldn't do this because it's right. wrong, um, Simpsons and other things. And I think if I were talking to my son about this, he would... And I'm trying to talk to him about um, trust and voting. His cynicism, his skepticism, which is a good thing, but shading into cynicism and distrust, which we have to fight back. It's very hard to know where the line is. I mean, how do you how do you encourage the one and discourage the other? Because the cynicism is corrosive. Well, I think you ask, of course, the essential question, and is the more cynical we get the less inclined we are to do anything about it. So one way to draw a division between the two is the degree to which you're willing to take an action. A cynic is, for the most part, done. They're not going to do anything. In a, their preoccupation is not to engage constructively, but rather to critique and be exasperated. So if, if one is skeptical, of course, the cynics in antiquity had a very different view. That wasn't what cynicism meant, but it is now what it means. If, uh, if one is skeptical but, but inclined to exercise that skepticism towards an improvement of something, then I think that's constructive. But I worry very much about cynicism and the degree which, which that then bleeds into nihilism. And um, we're all just waiting until the music stops. That's terrifying. So I think uh, maybe that what we can do, particularly with young people, is try to move them, if they're still on a continuum of skepticism to cynicism, move them back to skepticism. There are plenty of young people who are very angry and active in all kinds of ways. We're seeing expressions of that all over the world following the events of October 7th. And um, painful though it is, and hurtful though it is, that kind of action is much better than the, imagine the alternative where nobody's saying anything. Everybody's just in their house. We won't learn or make progress unless we get uncomfortable with each other. So I would, I would breed, encourage skepticism, and help them understand the difference between skepticism and cynicism. And any college student, I'd say you're far too young to be cynical. Like, you'll get there maybe someday, but right now, you have a different job. Okay, I'm going to go to uh, our online 
uh, audience, and we have a, uh, a, a question from actually one of our fellows who's confined with uh, uh, an illness right now. Uh, so my question is about the dark side of a reviving character. One context in which American society is enamored of character is criminal law, which is characterized by two opposing views of criminal behavior. It's either characterological, rooted in the perpetrator's innate character, uh, resulting in more severe and less temporary punishment, like the three strikes law, or it's situational, rooted in the circumstances in which the perpetrator found themselves and not reflecting the perpetrator's good character. When defendants are seen as deviant, typically black or poor, criminal conduct is seen as a reflection of character, and defendants are seen to have little hope of rehabilitation. <clears throat> when they're identified as having decent character, white, wealthy, educated, wrongdoing is seen as situational momentary lapse of judgment. So when assessment of character is shaped by destructive bias and can have destructive consequences, how can we invest in good character and limit the dangers of bias, biased reliance on character? It's a wonderful question, and I guess I would say that if we elevate the importance of the concept of character, then we'll be more nuanced and thoughtful in how we define it. And character, it doesn't belong for the most part. I'm not a lawyer, and I could get in trouble here, in a court of law. It's based on the evidence of, of the crime or the purported crime that is intended to produce some sort of version of truth and understanding. And now, admittedly, there are sometimes on sentencing and various other factors related to uh, to a court process to examine the character, which is effectively what they mean is the track record of the person. I think that the evidence of behavior is a fair consideration in a, consider in a legal proceeding, but s speculation about someone's character based on secondary features is irresponsible, fundamentally. But if we can be more thoughtful and enlightened about how we talk about this term, I don't believe we should use the term virtue, but I will say that Socrates and Plato and your old friend Aristotle, they thought about this a lot. Aristotle's Ethics is a very long book. So there are ways to be enlightened and intelligent in how we speak, speak about what this actually means and what it doesn't mean. The risk is the concept gets hijacked by the right or others who then use it as a cudgel to advance their own political self-interest. That is cynicism. That's what that is. And that's not what we're talking about. I see it. I, I want to be an equal opportunity questioner. I see an arm practically out in the Vanze. So I want you to, <laughs> I want you to go all the way back there. And, you know, I think it's the person, I think he has a mask. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Javier Rigueta, and I recently retired as a teacher of history and philosophy at a private school, which is also a Quaker school and an IB school in the United States. So uh, I went into teaching as a second career, I should say, after having been an executive at Apple uh, in, in, the, in the tech world for the first 20 years, and the latter 20 years as a teacher then of history, as I say, and philosophy, and what one would think would be ideal circumstances, right? Quaker school, an international baccalaureate school, independent, able to teach whatever it is you want. I am sorry to report to you that what I saw is that the institution that is trying or should be trying to do at scale exactly what it is that you're talking about, sir, is a blighted institution that has actually avoided this topic, actively so, for decades now, and continues to avoid it. And that all the more so now, because anybody teaching history or philosophy in the United States, whether you teach at a private school, or at a public school, you know you're walking in a minefield because you are unable to actually talk about the issues or more important, as we know, because talk is cheap, the most important things teachers used to be able to do was to model character. And it is so difficult to do that today with all of the political pressures on either side. But, but it's, it's a deeper issue than this, certainly. It's, a, it's an issue about relativism coming in, and yes, character has become associated entirely with the right. And so when I tried to bring up issues of character within my school, everybody just shied away. And with the International Baccalaureate, actually has had to bring back the issue of character 
They call it the learner profile. Okay, the learner profile. You know, ultimately, they had to come back to a notion of how do you talk about the excellences that human beings have, but they don't mention the word character. It is a toxic word, and it is a toxic word in part because it has been associated with the right, and, and, and therefore, I, I, I have to tell you, I mean, back to schools are not doing what the, the, the central job that they should be doing as the main institutions addressing your issue, in my view. Well, I think one of the issues, there's no question that higher education, certainly in the United States and education more generally, and perhaps elsewhere, is afflicted with a real problem about supporting freedom of expression and allowing the world to come into their institutions in ways that might make people uncomfortable. But we have seen in the last few weeks, especially, the consequences of being too careful about that, and I think there will be some recentering. I would also say there are lots, there's lots of evidence, nascent for sure, that these issues are being addressed. Yale University recently implemented a, a whole comprehensive program called Cultivating Conversations. And the goal is prospectively to help students understand we will make you uncomfortable. That is why you're here. Now here's how you deal with that. Here's what happens when you're in a classroom and somebody says something that offends you. Here's how you deal with the various challenges you might be afflicted with. Up until that moment, what was happening is we were mostly very defensive, trying to prevent that from happening and making sure the students feel supported and so forth. And I think we recognize categorically that's been a mistake. There needs to be a better mechanism that is both nurturing but also challenging. And that, the version at Yale, is one example of that, where they, it's a comprehensive program intended to help young people understand what it means to be in a space where you're going to be up against difference. It is fair to say, let me just use one quick analogy. When we think about what a court of law does, it is intended to surface truth by allowing different voices to come together within a system of trained people and a, system, and a, a whole set of rules. The goal in all of that trial stuff is that truth will surface. But to say to a bunch of students who have no experience with that, you're going to sit in a classroom and disagree with a lot of people and figure out a constructive way to understand difference, and it's asking too much of them because they have not, frankly, been raised in a way where they know how to do that. So let's think of that as a skill. And if we can cultivate that skill set in young people so that when they go into these environments, they recognize it's time to use this skill. I, that guy's really making me angry. But instead of having some sort of a scene about that, Here's what I can do. These are the skills that I can draw upon. And if we can do that more and more comprehensively, then we will be less afraid to have these kind of conversations on campuses. Leaders need to lead, and, and educational leaders need to be willing to. I was reflecting on this as a, I've been, as a, was a college president and an educational leader for most of my life. When you're, when you're called before Congress the way, say, our, those three presidents were, without judging them, I wasn't there, you sort of have to be prepared to lose your job. You have to be prepared to say what's important and what's right and count on the environment to support you there. And not to be, when the stakes are that high, not to be too concerned about making sure you're following a particular line of argument that counsel has given you, but to actually own the problem and speak candidly and authentically about it. But when you take those kinds of jobs, whether it's running a major research university or, or a secondary school, you kind of have to be ready to lose it because that could happen. OK. We went all the way in the back. We're going to go all the way in the front right now. Well, thank you so much for this talk. Um, I'm, I come from a whole different world. I'm a musician. I'm a pianist. Huh? And uh, I feel um, music and art uh, uh, plays a, a very great role in, uh, in developing character. Um, and my basic question, uh, there are two things. Um, the talk is always about um, universities, campuses. I mean, uh, the, you mentioned ethics, um, and I think uh, education has uh, deteriorated practically everywhere. Uh, here in, in America, uh, shouldn't it start in, um, in elementary school? Uh, ethics uh, and not religion, mm. because religion, uh, there are, uh, uh, I don't know, there are places uh, where creationists uh, teach uh, some very strange stuff. But uh, uh, ethics, um, shouldn't that be um, 
mandatory in, in, in the youngest uh, from the beginning. I mean, I think that's uh, where the seeds are sown. Uh, yeah, and the okay. other thing, I um, just want to mention it, is um, I am an immigrant. I came to America when I was eight, um, had all my education in, uh, there, and... Um, and um, the, uh, I thought it was a great time, but uh, um, what I wanted to mention is I went to the Federal Hall. Um, at that time, there were showcases with, uh, you mentioned, uh, Alexander Hamilton. And in one of them, I've never forgotten what he, uh, what he said. It has a lot to do with um, uh, capitalism. He said... Um, we need a strong federal government so that money doesn't rule us. Right. You know, and, and I think that's one of the major problems. What's, uh, it has totally gone out of hand. So the, the two things... If yeah. it, From what we know about Alexander Hamilton, if he wasn't so obnoxious, more people would have listened to him because he was right about almost everything. But he made people mad, and they didn't listen to him so much. Um, but I don't disagree. He was—he he had enormous foresight. I don't—I agree entirely. I think the idea of ethics, again, in a, in a kind of neutral way to help people understand systems of government, what are civics, how do we think about the way we comport ourselves, what is the ethical dimension of the human experience, those are things that every civilized society has always taught. But we're not doing that now. So I think there, there needs to be an authentic, time-appropriate way to do that. Again, what I want to avoid is saying back in the day, they knew. I don't know how to do it now. But if we have a population that has the obligations and the powerful responsibilities of citizenship and they abdicate those responsibilities through indifference or ignorance, we are failing them. And that's part of our obligation of those who are educators, those who are society's leaders, to try to put in place for them Thomas Jefferson said more generally, but an educated citizenry is fundamental to a functioning democracy. Without that, you fail. I have no objection to making that education begin when people are young. Unfortunately, we've got to stop here. This is incredibly painful. This is a great conversation. Uh, and I hope that you will take the opportunity of... Uh, uh, a glass of wine and, uh, and some dessert next door to continue it with our distinguished speaker, who I really want to thank for uh, provoking us and enlightening us in the best possible way and civil discourse at its best. So thank you very much for thank doing you. this. Thank you all very I'm much.